Hyundai's i30N is Korea's very first really credible performance hot hatch. Every car in this segment claims to be engineered to get your heart pumping and your pulse racing, but this one really can. Track tamed and road ready, it'll surprise you enormously. With this i30N hot hatch, Hyundai launches its new N performance sub-brand. It's the kind of car you simply wouldn't expect from the Korean maker, and it aims to compete on equal terms amongst the most established players in the volume part of the family hatch size GTI segment. That is a big ask. The established players in question include contenders like the Volkswagen Golf GTI, the Ford Focus ST and the Renault Sport Megane. Models that stop short of super hatch status, but cars that have spent decades refining their shopping rocket status. In contrast, in just 30 months, this i30N has gone from a speculative concept to a production reality. It surely can't be possible to upset the established order that easily, can it? Hyundai thinks it can. An 87% European sales increase in the last five years has given this company the means to pursue lofty ambitions. Funds that in this case were used to lure away top engineers from brands like Lamborghini, AMG and from BMW, one Albert Biermann. Prior to his move to this Korean manufacturer in 2014, he was the man behind most of that Munich maker's most significant M-branded performance cars over the last 20 years. Now, he is obviously someone who likes a challenge. Uh, the third generation version of Hyundai's i30 is a solid enough offering in the focus size family hatch segment, but it's not a car you would have thought would have been a fundamentally good starting point for a class leading hot hatch. Nevertheless, Hyundai was determined that a frantically quick i30 would be the model they would use to launch their Performance N sub-brand to the world, building on their World Rally Championship exploits. It would prove that the company could make properly credible fast cars, and it would give the image of this fast-growing South Korean maker a much-needed boost. So, Beerman and his colleagues rolled up their sleeves and they got to work, changing, well, just about everything that matters in order to create the completed i30 N model that we're about to fire up. The N, by the way, references Namyang, which is Hyundai's global R&D center in Korea, and the legendary Nürburgring Nordschleife circuit, where over 6,000 miles of testing produced the finished product, hence the way that the letter's logo symbolizes a racetrack chicane. But exactly how good is this car? We're about to find out. So, what's it like behind the wheel? Well, forget everything you know about Hyundai because none of that is relevant here. This hot hatch has been developed by people who seriously love their cars. Now, you might wonder about that before setting off, but you will doubt it a little less once you fire up the engine and you tune into the potent warble of that race style exhaust. Most hot hatches reference the ordinary models they're based on to some extent. Yes, you get more power, a stiffer ride, spoilers and sport seats, but underneath it all, the DNA is much the same. An i30N though is different, which is what you'll want to hear if you're thinking of buying one. Even if you're not familiar with the ordinary third generation i30 hatch, you probably won't find it difficult to believe that there are really very few focus size models less suited for conversion in to super shopping rocket status, which is why just about everything that could be changed in creating this high performance derivative absolutely has been. It has to, after all, completely change people's ideas of the kind of cars Hyundai is capable of making. The man charged with uh, delivering this paradigm shift in public perception was ex-BMW chief engineer Albert Biermann, and he and his team set to work with a will in pulling the basic i30 recipe apart to create this car. Aluminium has been added to the electronically controlled suspension to reduce weight and increase stiffness, plus there's a bespoke fit set of adaptive dampers. Uh, the single gearbox option, a six-speed manual stick shift, has been specially developed for this car, and its clutch is been uprated. Uh, there is also a selectable rev matching system which makes you sound like Fernando Alonso when you're downshifting through the gears. 
In addition, the brakes are beefier, camber stiffness is up, and the Pirelli P0 tires are of a unique compound. Yes, the two liter GDI engine is derived from a unit that Hyundai's had on its books for some time, but it's been embellished with a new turbo and a new intake manifold. Get the idea? No expense has been spared here as part of a development regime, which is on a different level from that of most like-minded rivals. But then, as we've already suggested, Hyundai had a lot of catching up to do as part of its need to create a credible hot hatch lineup from scratch. That's why, at least to begin with, anyway, this model uh, has to appeal to the widest possible range of buyers in this class by stretching itself between two distinct subsectors in the family hatch based shopping rocket market. There's an entry level 250 PS standard derivative, which is aimed at the Golf GTI and Focus ST crowd, and the version that almost all i30 N buyers will choose, this top 275 PS performance version, which aims to stretch up through Renault Sport, Megane territory towards faster, even more accomplished and significantly pricier sector trendsetters like the Honda Civic Type R. Now you'll need this performance variant to get both the emotive sounding active variable exhaust that we referenced at the beginning and also another key feature of this Hyundai, a uh, proper mechanical electronic limited slip differential for extra cornering traction. Now most front driven cars in this part of the hot hatch market uh, will deliver that via a software program which works the kind of um, simple torque vectoring by braking system that you get on the base version of this model. Uh, now this sort of setup uh, sees the ESC stability system dabbing away at the brakes at speed through turns um, in order to try to bring the nose into line. This top i30N model's ELSD diff is on another level from that. It's much more like the kind of serious package that you get in a really exotic super hatch. It's designed to subtly tighten your line through any given bend and allow you to get on the power much earlier through the exit of the corner. It works brilliantly too, and it's one of a number of things about this car that leave you minded to overlook the fact that its engine output does leave it lacking a little in comparison to some obvious rivals, although not by much in the case of this performance model. Make use of the standard launch control system, and that's a rare feature to find on a manual model, rating your progress with the standard acceleration timer, and that's brilliant, and you'll find that 62 miles an hour from rest occupies 6.1 seconds, and that's three tenths quicker than the base version and about a second or so away from the ultimate class standard for hot hatches uh, at or around the 300 PS power point. Should that matter? Well, if you measure GTI desirability in terms of acceleration times, then maybe. Uh, Beerman and his Nürburgring Nordschleife development team, though, don't. They claim less interest in RPM and more in what they call BPM, heart beats per minute. It sounds a bit tacky, but means quite a lot. BPM starts in the driveway, or ideally in the paddock or pit lane, should you have ventured onto a track day and shocked all the regulars by turning up in a Hyundai. Uh, the idea is that you should be able to set up your i30N just as a professional driver would tune the settings on his race car. And that means more than just being able to select some sort of sporty drive mode. All cars in this class offer that kind of option, but this i30N sets a fresh standard when it comes to ultimate configurability with systems of that sort. These light blue steering wheel buttons are your access point to what's on offer. The left-hand one deals with the standard drive settings, normal, eco, and sport, and they tweak uh, steering, throttle response, stability settings, and the suspension stiffness for the required tarmac territory. The right-hand switch, meanwhile, is the one that you'll need for the ballistic end mode which in all of those areas dials everything up to the absolute max. Of course on a public road uh, you'll almost never want to dial everything up to the absolute max and sure enough the first time you try this car and you fail to resist the allure of end mode you'll find the steering oversensitive and the suspension hopelessly over firm. Well, that's no problem. Figure out your likes and dislikes and then configure them using the alternative end custom settings you'll find on the end mode section of the center dash display screen. Uh, preferably do that when you're stationary because it's a right faff to do it when you're on the move. Basically, there are two areas of N custom programmability, powertrain and chassis. Now with powertrain, you get normal sport and sport plus options for the engine throttle response, uh, the exhaust sound, and for that rev matching system for gearbox downshifts that we referenced earlier. Plus, you can set up the ELSD diff in either normal or sport settings. 
In the chassis section, there are normal sport and sport plus modes for the suspension and the steering. Plus, there's normal sport or completely off options for the ESC stability control. Now, if you think that sounds like a lot of choices, then you're absolutely right. Apparently, in all, there are 1,944 possible setup combinations. But unlike some other systems of this sort, they really do influence the handling and response of this car in a meaningful way. Dial down the suspension and the steering to sport while going for the most aggressive Sport Plus engine and diff settings, and we reckon you'll have hit the sweet spot. Once you've got everything programmed, all you have to do is click the right-hand steering wheel mode button into End Custom to immediately access your preferred setup. Other issues? Uh, well, not many. Certainly evident that Beerman and his development team had little or no interest in creating the kind of premium sporty cockpit environment that most buyers in this segment will be used to. And the engineers were also forced to use the standard i30s electric power steering setup, which certainly wasn't ideal. Although they have tweaked it quite a lot, the end result isn't perfect in terms of end user feel. Uh, that's whichever of the various setting combinations you end up with. Uh, you could say the same about the suspension, which basically offers firm, firmer or rock-hard options, although that is hardly unique with cars of this kind. Ultimately, though, there's so much here to like that it seems churlish to try to find tiny faults. The Duriger popping and banging from the exhaust if you're in one of the end modes sounds just great. Uh, the tactile short throw gear change is brilliant, and the throttle response punches aggressively from really low revs and remains crisp right up to the point where the engine's really singing around about 6,000 RPM. Torque steer, that writhing of the steering wheel that you get under hard acceleration in less well-developed front-driven hot hatches, that's admirably well controlled. And in this performance variant, the engine features an overboost function which raises peak torque pulling power from 353 through 378 newton meters for up to eight seconds to facilitate the kind of super quick overtake that a lesser hot hatch might really struggle with. The top speed, by the way, is artificially limited to 155 miles an hour. Get used to everything and in the dry at least, uh, tight turns at speed are basically all about confidence. Once you have it with this car, you'll find that the ELSD diff of this performance variant allows you to get on the power astonishingly early in the bend as the front tires bite and the rear end points the nose into the apex. This car just loves to corner at speed. The brakes are spot on too, designed apparently for at least half a day of hard track use. If you want to heel and toe in the classic style and the pedals are positioned for it, if not, then that brilliant rev matching system is just a button push away. Ultimately, this is an astonishingly accomplished showing. The i30N gets more and more rewarding the faster you drive it. That's just as every hot hatch should. It must be difficult to know how to visually pitch a hot hatch of this kind if you're a company starting out in the segment. A brand new to this sector wouldn't really get away with the paired back, conservatively sporty looks of a Golf GTI, nor could it pull off the extrovert divisiveness of a Civic Type R. So what you're then left with is the difficult job of appealing to buyers with preferences at both those extremes. Perhaps it's not surprising then that the look of an i30N probably isn't the first thing you're fondly remember about it. Not that there's uh, anything about this car's appearance that might dissuade you from initial interest. Uh, Size-wise, this Korean contender strikes a middle ground in the class. It's 77 millimeters longer than a Golf GTI, but a full 220 mils shorter than a Civic Type R. But here, from a profile perspective, you start to get a feel for this hot hatch model's purposeful intent. Now, its disappointing predecessor, the second generation i30 model's top turbo derivative, was difficult to distinguish from humbler range stable mates, but this i30N is very different and its proven track credentials will be obvious at a glance to committed enthusiasts. The wheels, for example, they're so big that Hyundai's had to broaden the arches they sit in. 18-inch rims fitted to the ordinary version and 19 inches standard on this performance derivative. Both are shod with bespoke Pirelli rubber. Look more closely and you'll spot red N-branded calipers between the spokes and at about the same time, you might also note that this uh, car has lowered suspension. The firmer springs of this top variant place it eight millimeters closer to the tarmac. 
Uh, the front extra cooling vents are incorporated right across the lower part of the nose section so as to channel air towards the GDI turbo engine and the uprated brakes. Central louvres have been added below the prominent end braided cascading style front grille. These are flanked by wider corner inlets with the slim LED daytime running lights repositioned just above. Full LED headlamps deliver an appropriately piercing glare and this red lower splitter adds a smart finishing touch. All that's really missing are a couple of bonnet bulges to create a bit of extra visual drama further up. Uh, the rear also features a carefully judged package of more aggressive styling features, highlighted by this DTM style roof spoiler with its triangular central brake light, and a bespoke bumper with angled corner inserts and a red framed lower diffuser complete with double muffler exhausts. These aerodynamic fins on the bodywork just above the rear wheels are another nice touch. Enough with that, let's take a seat at the wheel. Yes, we're a bit disappointed too. No red flashes, no bucket seats, uh, no DTM style flat bottom steering wheel. Development boss Albert Biermann and his team at the Nürburgring thought you'd be beyond all that kind of frippery. We're not quite so sure. <laughs> if you like a bit of minimalism in your hot hatch though, it might suit you just fine. Now, should you go looking for it, there is subtle end branding on the floor mats, uh, the door sill scuff plates, the steering wheel, and on this lovely round tactile gear knob. Plus, there are these unusual light boo drive mode and end mode buttons on the steering wheel. But that's about it in terms of the cabin changes made to create this shopping rocket model. Or at least you think it is, until you start to examine the various information displays provided. As you can see, the primary one is this 8-inch colour touchscreen that dominates the centre of the dash. This is a display you'll want to keep in its bespoke N mode uh, whenever you're enjoying this car in the way it was designed to be driven. Now here you can peruse your selected custom drive mode settings, you can monitor cornering G-forces and keep an eye out on the readouts for turbo pressure, torque and power. Uh, there's also a performance timer section that as well as the usual lap timer, also includes an acceleration timer that you can set to your preferred target speed. Getting comfortable is easy, thanks to plenty of seat and wheel adjustment, although you don't get adjustable lumbar support with entry-level trim. In this performance spec variant, by the way, you usually get sports seats which are attractively trimmed with leatherette bolsters and faux suede, but those chairs have been deleted here for normal cloth-trimmed items so as to achieve a, well, frankly, insignificant 12.7 kilogram weight reduction. Now, that might save you a couple of hundredths a lap, but it certainly doesn't help the, well, rather the drab cabin ambiance we were referring to earlier. What else? Um, well, cabin quality might be a notch or two down from what you get in, say, a uh, rival Golf GTI, but we've no real issue with interior ergonomics, unless you count the slightly restricted levels of rear three-quarter vision. Uh, that centre dash screen is particularly easy to use. That's partly because it retains the physical dials and buttons that some rival setups unwisely dispense with. Its more normal features include satellite navigation, uh, a DAB audio setup, and a package of TomTom Tom Live services alert you to speed cameras, update you on the weather and provide accurate information on traffic jams and roadworks. Uh, you can also connect in your smartphone handset using the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring systems. Cabin practicality is reasonable with bottle holders in the door pockets, uh, an overhead compartment for your sunglasses and this storage compartment under the ventilation controls which contains USB, aux in and two 12 volt sockets plus a standard wireless phone charging mat. Uh, you also get a reasonably spacious glove box, uh, this central lidded storage bin and this pair of cup holders next to the thankfully conventional handbrake. Although uh, small bottles placed in those will get in the way of your route to the gear lever. Time to move into the rear. Uh, now you get these wide opening doors and the squarely orientated roof makes rear access straightforward. And once inside, um, well, what can we tell you? It's not the roomiest rear cabin in the class. You'll need the Skoda Octavia VRS for that. But by the standards of most other family hatch-sized GTI segment contenders, uh, the space provided here is quite competitive and it's probably as much as most buyers will need. 
As with most other cars in the sector, it's not possible to sit three fully sized adults back here with any real degree of comfort. Although if you absolutely had to squeeze in a trio of adults, you'd be helped by the uh, low height of this central transmission tunnel. If there are only two of you, then you'll find that there's reasonable space for legs, knees and shoulders. Uh, those approaching six foot in height could find their heads brushing the ceiling though. These large side windows help to avoid the rather claustrophobic feeling you get when you're sat in the back of some rivals, uh, Civic Type R for example. Uh, unfortunately on this hot hatch model you don't get the central rear vents that you would get on an ordinary plush i30. Uh, that's a bit disappointing uh, but you do get the usual center armrest with incorporated cup holders. Netted mat pockets in the back of the front seats provide somewhere to pack loose items and there are small bins in both doors. Plus there are Isofix charge seat mounts on the two outer chairs. Finally, let's take a look inside this Hyundai's boot. Uh, the tailgate is simple to open thanks to a proper handle there in the panel. That's something that some rivals now don't bother with. Uh, it's light to lift up and it opens to reveal a low loading sill and a large entrance. So getting bigger, heavier boxes in and out is straightforward. Uh, the 381 litre cargo capacity is class competitive. And that's despite the fact that it's 14 litres down on what you'll get in the ordering i30 on account of this rear strut brace that stretches across the floor at the back of the load area. Now you get a 12 volt socket and a couple of hooks in the upper side trims to stop your shopping bags from spilling all over the carpet. Uh, there's no additional underfloor space but that's only because laudably Hyundai includes a proper space saver spare wheel as standard equipment. If you do need more space and you want to push this rear backrest forward uh, there's up to 1,287 litres of carrying capacity available in this configuration. There are two i30N variants on offer, both with five doors and both using basically the same two litre turbocharged engine driving through the front wheels and mated to a six speed manual gearbox. As is common at this price point, there's no paddle shift auto option, nor is there the chance to specify four wheel drive. Uh, the standard model puts out 250 PS, it costs around 25,000 pounds and it's targeted at conventional family hatch shopping rockets like Volkswagen's Golf GTI and Ford's Focus ST. Hyundai I though expect uh, over 90% of i30N buyers to find an extra £3,000 to get themselves into the alternative £28,000 N performance variant that we're testing today. Now with this more desirable derivative, you get a version of that same GDI engine tuned to develop 275 PS, plus an important package of extra engineering features, including an electronic limited slip differential and an active variable exhaust system, plus some tempting trimming embellishments, which we'll cover off in a minute. Now in this upgraded form, this Hyundai can tilt at more powerful volume class contenders like the Seat Land Cupra 300 and the Renault Sport Megane, and potentially, even even start to trouble so-called super hatches with just over 300 PS, cars like Honda's Civic Type R and Volkswagen's Golf R. Now both i30N variants come with asking prices that take this Korean brand into more expensive territory than it's ever previously been in with a car of this size, but the required sticker figures still look good value in comparison to those of obvious rivals. Uh, the standard i30N 250 PS model undercuts an entry level Ford Focus ST2 by £1,000 and a base 230 PS Golf GTI by £3,500. Even a base Skoda Octavia VRS cost nearly £700 more. Uh, this i30N Performance 275 PS variant equals the price of a top spec Ford Focus ST3, yet it offers significantly more power and a more dynamic driving experience. Plus it undercuts a far less involving Peugeot 308 GTI by £600. Uh, you'll need a £30,000 budget, so around £2,000 more than you'll pay for this top i30N for cars like the Seat Leon Cupra 300, uh, the Renault Sport Megane and the Volkswagen Golf GTI Performance 245 PS. Yes. Hyundai also hopes that buyers will note that this i30N performance model gets within a fraction of the speed of cars like Honda's Civic Type R and Volkswagen's Golf R, yet it will save you up to £5,000 on models of that kind if you were going to demand like-for-like -like levels of equipment. If having considered all of that, you conclude that this South Korean contender really is worth your attention, then the deal might be sealed by strong standards of equipment. So let's take a look at that now. 
Now let's start with the ordinary 250 PS variant and focus first on the standard hot hatch engineering features. Uh, the driving settings system with its special end mode button, uh, the electronically controlled adaptive suspension, uh, the launch control setup, the rev matching system for smoother down changes, uh, the rear stiffness bar and the end mode performance information display. In addition, you get 18-inch alloy wheels, LED headlights, N-exclusive sports seats, uh, climate control, rain-sensing wipers, front and rear parking sensors, and a rear-view camera. Plus, there's a Fatum Category 1 alarm, a smart key keyless entry and start system, and an auto defog system, which uh, clears the windscreen more quickly on misty days. Infotainment's taken care of by an 8-inch center dash screen, and it includes navigation as well as a traffic messaging channel, and Hyundai's map care and live services that aim to keep you bang up to date with what's happening on the roads. Uh, the screen also lets you attach smart devices to the car using the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto systems, while a wireless phone charging pad in the front tray tops up your handset's battery without the need to attach any cables. As we were saying earlier, though, the vast majority of likely buyers will want to get themselves into the upgraded i30N performance variant that we're trying here. Well, why wouldn't you? The burbling active variable exhaust system and the way that the ELSD limited slip differential plants the car coming out of corners are both things absolutely central to the appeal of this car. Plus, with performance spec, there's a bit more visual drama, both inside and out, thanks to faux suede and leather seat trimming and larger 19-inch wheels shod with special Pirelli P0 tyres. Other standard features at this level include reinforced brakes and lumbar support for the front chairs, along with powered adjustment and memory settings. Let's finish with a perusal of the safety stuff on offer. That's an area in which all i30 models put in a strong showing with a pretty complete roster of the kind of camera-driven features that modern buyers tend to look for these days. Uh, that means that an autonomous emergency braking system, including forward collision warning, comes as standard. It's a kind of setup that, as you drive, scans the road ahead, searching for potential collision hazards. Uh, if one's detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or you aren't able to, maybe, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Uh, the other uh, noteworthy standard fit camera driven feature is the lane departure warning system with lane keep assist setup. Now this will warn you if the car is unintentionally wandering over a road marking before gently steering your i30 back to where it ought to be. Other standard safety features are more familiar. There are twin front side and curtain airbags, Isofix rear child seat fastenings, and active front head restraints that prevent whiplash. In addition, as usual with a family hatch of this kind, there's ESC, electronic stability control, tire pressure monitoring, and hill start assist control to stop the car from rolling backwards as you pull away on inclines. Plus, a speed limit information function pitches speed signs as you pass and then displays them for you on the dash. As you'd also expect in this segment, the ABS anti-lock brakes are aided in panic stops by a brake assist feature, plus an emergency stop signal uh, which flashes the hazard lights to warn following motorists. In addition, a standard driver attention alert system monitors for signs of fatigue and it'll prompt you to take a break during a journey. Uh, before perusing this i30 and model's fuel and CO2 stats, uh, we expected it to lag behind rivals a little in this regard. After all, the uh, two-liter GDI petrol engine that this model's turbo power plant's based around doesn't have a reputation for being particularly frugal. Plus, there's a fact that with a curb weight of around 1.5 tons, this car is one of the heavier hot hatches in the segment. As it is, though, uh, this Hyundai does get pretty close to the required class standard. The ordinary version manages 40.4 mpg on the combined cycle and 159 grams per kilometer of CO2. Those are figures that fall only slightly to 39.8 mpg and 163 grams per kilometer if you go for this upgraded performance model. Now that translates into a benefiting kind tax liability of either 30 or 31 percent. To give you some class perspective, the fuel and CO2 figures we've just quoted are pretty much the same as those you get from a Ford Focus ST, and they get within a fraction of the figures that you manage in a rival Volkswagen Golf GTI Performance 245 PS variant. Amongst obvious rivals, only Peugeot's 308 GTI does significantly better, but that's mainly because that car's nearly 300 kilos lighter. 
Of course, as usual with a hot hatch, if you get anywhere near the quoted figures in real world use, then you probably shouldn't have bothered buying this car in the first place. Still, if you are in a frugal state of mind, it'll be useful to be able to slot into the eco driving mode and focus all of the car systems on efficiency. As you'd expect, the i30N features the brand's ISG, intelligent stop and go technology that cuts the engine when you don't need it uh, when you're stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. What else might you need to know? Um, likely residual values, well, they're much better than we'd expected they might be, given that Hyundai is such an unknown brand in this segment. Independent experts reckon that after three years or 60,000 miles, a standard version of this car will retain 43% of its original asking price. Uh, for this performance variant, that figure will rise to 44%. An even stronger buying incentive is the five-year unlimited mileage warranty that comes as standard. That's backed up by breakdown cover that lasts the same length of time and free annual vehicle health checks over the duration. Uh, with rival brands, you're limited to three years of cover and a mileage limit. As for servicing, well, this hot hatch model will require no more maintenance than any other i30 variant, uh, so a garage visit will be needed once every year or every 10,000 miles, whichever comes sooner. If you want to budget ahead for routine maintenance, then there are various Hyundai Sense packages which offer fixed price servicing over two, three or five year periods. Uh, you can pay for your plan monthly and you can add MOTs into the three or five year plans for an extra fee. Talking of budgeting, make sure you remember that the bespoke Pirelli P0 tyres with their special compound aren't going to be cheap to replace, so bear that in mind before you go tyre smoking and showboating on a track day. Now the final financial consideration of course is insurance, and that did used to be exorbitant for a hot hatch with this kind of power, but it's not quite so ridiculous these days. Uh, you're looking at a grouping of 27E for the standard model and 28E for this performance version. Is this the fastest, most involving hot hatch for sale at this price point? Well, having put this i30N to a thorough test, we'd say so, which is an astonishing achievement from a manufacturer with virtually no previous GTI experience whatsoever. Perhaps it helped Hyundai's engineers that there was no particular industry expectation that they would succeed here. No sporting brand values to uphold, no illustrious predecessor to match. Of course, there are faster, grippier and more extreme hot hatches than this, but they're all much more expensive. And in most cases, they're no more fun. Of course, this Hyundai isn't perfect. For ultimate sales success, it probably needs to look more special than it does, both inside and out. And that, along with the unfamiliar badge on the boot lid, will probably make the i30N a rare sight on our roads. But it doesn't deserve to be. Should brand equity, cabin quality and visual drama really be among your primary priorities when you're buying a car of this kind? Well, we'd say no. For us, the buying proposition of a hot hatch, any hot hatch, begins and ends with driving enjoyment. And here, this Hyundai is very difficult to fault. True, the steering isn't absolutely perfect and the ride will always be on the firm side, but the fact that this car is so much more configurable than most of its rivals helps greatly here. Once you get the various settings right, you'll get yourself a shopping rocket that on the right road on the right day can make something like a Golf GTI look dull and compromised. Perhaps Hyundai's World Rally Championship exploits have played a part in making this possible. Or maybe it's just the single-minded determination of the development team to make this i30 into a memorable driving machine, whatever it took. Either way, what's served up here is encouraging, energized and engaging. But will it be enough to deliver instant credibility for Hyundai in this segment? It'll be interesting to see.